Amen. Well, good morning, church. It is good to be with you today. I'm glad we can come together at all of our different campuses and online. I'm glad to be back with you today. This week, uh, me and my wife, Amy, got away for a little vacation at the beach. And I think I was the only person there who lost weight that week as I was sweating in bed, sick as a dog, the entire time. But I'm back now on antibiotics and steroids, <laughs> ready to preach the word of God. And I believe God's gonna do great things. The highlight of my week was when my sweet wife took my face in her hands and said, you're getting a lot of gray hair. <laughs> she said, you look so distinguished. So I'm feeling a little midlife crisis-y this weekend. Think I'm gonna buy a Harley after church. <laughs> Praise God. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word in this time together. We pray that you would forgive us for any sin in our lives so we can come before your pure word with pure hearts. I pray that you would help my voice to preach this message at least one time. I pray that you would bless it in Jesus' name, amen. I'm gonna be continuing our series in 1 Corinthians from chapter three, focusing on verses five through 15. And I wanna to talk to you today about your eternal reward. Your eternal reward. How many of you have ever thought about retirement? <laughs> right, the concept of getting ready for retirement is you save, you plan, you invest so that you'll have enough money to survive when you're too old to work any longer. And one of the things I'm so thankful for is that as a child, even before I had any money of my own, my parents taught me about budgeting and how to handle money wisely, which I think is a really good thing for godly parents to teach their kids. My mom would take me to and from school listening to the Dave Ramsey show. <laughs> any kids catechized by Dave Ramsey growing up besides me? Yeah, it was a great thing. So before I even earned money, I had a plan. When I got my first paycheck from Uncle Sam, I invested in my Roth IRA. And man, that's just a great testament to the legacy that godly parents can have and create for their kids. Some of you guys are really on track, saving for retirement. Maybe you've done really well just planning, and I celebrate your success. And others of you would say, I'm still in school maybe, young kids, I never thought about retirement a day in my life. Or maybe you say, I'm way behind, I haven't saved enough, and that maybe really stresses you out about not being ready to retire. If you're one of those people who's not ready and you're stressed, I wanna bring you some comfort today so you don't worry too much about not having enough for retirement. There's good news. Even if you get to retirement age and you do not have enough saved and you struggle to survive and pay for your needs, the good news is it's not going to last forever because you'll eventually die. <laughs> Even if you spend the last 20 years of your life in a van down by the river eating cat food, it'll eventually come to a blessed end. Praise God. Isn't that great? On the other hand, if you're really financially successful, maybe you're so rich, you got millions upon millions of dollars in your 401k and everything that money can buy, I've got bad news, you're eventually gonna die. So you'll, you've only got one lifetime to enjoy those riches, and I really hope you do, but enjoy it while you can because it will not last forever. So there's bad news, there's good news, and then there's really, really good news. How many of you are ready for that? Whether you're rich or poor in this life, and whether you live a long life or a short life, you can faithfully serve the Lord in a way that will result in an eternal reward. And not only will you receive an eternal reward, but you'll have all eternity to enjoy your reward. But to receive an eternal reward, you have to think ahead, and you must live, serve, and give with eternity in mind. If you do, not only will you be personally rewarded by Jesus, but you'll leave a lasting legacy on this earth that even after you die continues making an impact in the lives of others. Doesn't that sound good? 
Amen. We're going to play a little drinking game today where every time I say something good, you amen like your life depends on it, and I'll take a drink of tea. (laughs) Praise God. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 5. After all, who is Apollos? Who is Paul? We are only God's servants through whom you believe the good news. Each of us did the work the Lord gave us. I planted the seed in your hearts and Apollos watered it, but it was God who made it grow. It is not important who does the planting or who does the watering. What's important is that God makes the seed grow. The one who plants and the one who waters work together with the same purpose and both will be rewarded for their own hard work. So Paul preached first in Corinth planting the gospel seed. Apollos was another evangelist who came along and watered with more teaching, uh, articulate teaching he was known for. The Holy Spirit made the seed grow and produced salvation in the hearts of the listeners. No one person gets the credit. It takes a team. Uh, For example, I'm up here preaching to you right now, but I didn't get here by myself. People came here before me today and turned the lights on and opened up the building and welcomed you to church. People cleaned the building this week. Before that, people built the building. Before that, people gave to build the building. Before they gave, someone preached the gospel to them and led them to Christ and discipled them in the Lord. Before those people were led to Christ, someone else preached to them, and it goes all the way back. And we're part of a string of people who have been faithfully serving the Lord all the way back to the apostles, all the way back to the forefathers in the faith in Old Testament times. Some people have different parts to play and they play their parts faithfully. Maybe on stage, they play an instrument. Maybe in the nursery, they play with babies. But either way, they're serving the Lord and doing their part and all of us working together, plant, we water, We don't take individual credit. We know that the Lord gets all the glory because he's the one who produces growth and brings to life the seeds that are planted. Everyone who does good work unto the Lord, whether it's seen or celebrated in this life, will be rewarded by the Lord in the life to come. You will be rewarded for your own hard work. You might have a very godly mama or grandma but you will not get rewarded for your grandma's faithfulness to the Lord. You will be judged based on what you do with what God gave you, what you did with your your gifting, your abilities, your finances, your resources, your energy, everything that God gave you, he will judge you based on how you stewarded it. I wanna encourage you in this. Think about how the Holy Spirit will cause these gospel seeds to spring to life, sometimes years after they've been planted. Some of you might have a family member who's far from God. Anybody? Let's say that's me. I I want you to know you're not the only one. So if you have a family member you love that's far from God, yeah, raise your hand at whatever campus you're at. You might sometimes feel discouraged that that person hasn't yet come to saving faith, and you might pray for them. But I want to encourage you not just to pray for them, but pray for the people who who God will send to them, who will water the seed that you planted faithfully, so that when the Holy Spirit prompts that person, pray that they will step forward in courage and boldness to speak the truth to your son, your daughter, your brother, your uncle, your aunt, and and know that just like you're praying for that person to be faithful, some other grandma or brother or father is out there praying that you will be faithful. When God prompts you to share Jesus with their loved one, And I pray that you would have the Holy Spirit-powered boldness to stand up and proclaim the good news, to water the seeds that were planted when your time comes, so that you might share in the reward. The question is, will you step up and obey when God calls you to do your part? Think about this. If the Holy Spirit makes the seed grow, Why doesn't God just do all the planting and watering and growing by himself? Why? It's because he wants the opportunity to reward you for faithfulness. When I was nine years old, I went to my dad one afternoon and I said, Dad, I would like $10. And he asked me, why do you want $10? And I said, because I want candy. 
and he decided to give me an opportunity to earn the $10. So he told me I could mow the lawn, and as a reward, I would get the money. He wanted to teach me about hard work so I wouldn't just become entitled and, you know, demanding. So I did a terrible job mowing the lawn, and my dad gave me the $10. I got the candy. I got chubby. I was happy, you know? It was like... <laughs> well, think about it. He could have just made me mow the lawn in exchange for the thousands of dollars a year it cost to raise me. But he gave me an opportunity to be rewarded for hard work because there's something that we learn from that. There's something special about that. And there's a desire we have. There's something that rises up in us that feels, we feel a sense of of purpose when we can work for and receive a reward. Have you ever thought about the biblical difference between a gift and a reward? Think about it. A gift is freely given out of love and is freely received with a grateful heart. For example, salvation, Ephesians 2 eight says, God saved you by his grace when you believed, and you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. You just say thank you. Salvation is a gift we receive by God's grace, his love, his favor, and kindness. When you have faith in Christ Jesus for salvation, we can't take credit for a gift given by God. We just receive it and say thank you, but we can take credit for a reward earned through good works. Romans 4.4 highlights this difference. When people work, their wages are not a gift, but something they have earned. But people are counted as righteous, not because of their work, but because of their faith in God who forgives sinners. That perfectly highlights the difference right there. Here you see the difference between the gift of salvation and the reward earned for good works. So listen, you get into the kingdom of heaven through faith, but you get rewarded in the kingdom of heaven for faithfulness. You get into the kingdom of heaven through faith, but you get rewarded in the kingdom of heaven for faithfulness. The devil flips and counterfeits God's system to create all false religions. So in every other religion, every other religion is false. Every other religion ultimately boils down to you earn salvation through faithfulness or good works, which we know as Bible reading Christians does not ultimately lead to salvation. So people who fall into these false religions end up not getting the gift God only gives freely and they do not earn the reward the devil enticed them with in the first place. If you work for your salvation, the only reward you earn is death. But the devil's deception works so well, listen, because in our pride, we want to earn salvation. Because if I earned it, I get to take the credit. Women usually aren't as susceptible to this temptation as men are. Women are better at receiving gifts because it makes them feel loved. Men love earning prizes because it makes us feel proud. (laughs) This is why every false religion is founded by men and offers things that would sound very awesome to junior high boys. (laughs) Like, I get 72 virgins in heaven? Sweet. I get to be the god of my own planet with multiple wives having sex for all eternity? Awesome. I'm talking about the M&Ms, the Muslims and Mormons. But there is a type of holy ambition to achieve that God puts in the hearts of mankind. And that can be righteously harnessed for God's glory. Your drive, listen men, your drive to accomplish and achieve originally came from God. But it was corrupted by sin. In the garden, God told Adam and Eve to be fruitful and multiply, to fill the earth and subdue it. In other words, God said, take dominion and build stuff. And if you're a man, you go, okay, I like this. So your inner drive to earn a prize can be used to fuel your faithfulness to God and his calling on your life, which will result in eternal reward. And scripture talks about how we can be rewarded for doing our part. 
you get this picture first from the Apostle Paul of planting and watering those gospel seeds that lead to salvation. And that is a picture of organic spiritual growth, which could even look like just drive-by discipleship. Ba, 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 ba. Like drive-by discipleship is where I might just pop into your life for a brief moment. I might run into you in line at the coffee shop or the grocery store, and I might just be able to share Jesus with you briefly and just tell you, hey, God loves you and Jesus wants to save you, and if you repent of your sins, you can be forgiven and go to heaven. And then I could disappear like Batman, never to be seen again. And someone else might come along years later and water that seed and show the love of God to you and encourage you. And the Holy Spirit would make that seed grow at a certain time according to his plan. And we would all be rewarded for our brief moment investing in your life, watering, planting, and being faithful. That's one of the ways. But that's kind of an organic process that happens as opportunities arise. Then in verse 9, the Apostle Paul switches metaphors from organic seed planting to intentional building. Intentional building, a building process. And these aren't random acts of kindness, but rather systematic kingdom building. To build something, you need a plan. You need a process. You need persistence. You need a plan. You need a process. You need persistence. In 1 Corinthians 3, verse 9, he goes on to say, For we are both God's workers, and you are God's field. That's the first analogy. Now he switches to the next analogy. You are God's building. You are God's building. Who is the you here? It's the local church. It's the church of Jesus Christ. It's everyone who believes in Jesus. You are God's building. Some people will sometimes scoff at Christianity and say, it's not about a building. We don't need a building. Well, the, the Bible actually uses an analogy of a building to describe us. And it's a good analogy for how the church functions. Because of God's grace to me, I have laid the foundation like an expert builder. Now others are building on it. But whoever is building on this foundation must be very careful, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one we already have, Jesus Christ. So he said, I laid the foundation because of God's grace to me. I'm not taking any credit for it. The apostle Paul was literally knocked to the ground by Jesus who appeared to him, called him, saved him, and went on to teach him what he knew about the gospel. So he's like, this just happened to me. I was yanked out of the fires of hell by God's grace. And now I'm preaching Christ crucified and risen again. That is the foundation of our faith. Any other message beside that leads to destruction, but Jesus Christ leads to life. Chapter one talks about how in Christ we experience the power of God and the wisdom of God. Trusting in Jesus is how we receive the gift of salvation. And that's the foundation of everything we do. Then we build upon that, goes on to say in verse 12. Anyone who builds on that foundation may use a variety of materials. Notice this. Gold, silver, and jewels, one category. Wood, hay, or straw, the next category. But on the judgment day, this is the judgment of Christians by Jesus, the judgment seat of Christ, fire will reveal what kind of work each builder has done. The fire will show if a person's work has any value. If the work survives, that builder will receive a reward. Cha-ching! Yay! But if the work is burned up, the builder will suffer great loss. The builder will be saved, but like someone barely escaping through a wall of flames. So every single human who's ever lived will be judged by God. Those who reject Jesus will be judged, and those who accept Jesus will also be judged. But these two groups will experience two very different judgments. Group one, the lost. The lost are judged to be condemned for sin. Group two, the saved. The saved are judged to be rewarded for faithfulness. So you will be judged, but if you believe in Jesus, you don't need to fear judgment day. The lost, listen, the lost don't get rewarded for any good works done in this life. All their good deeds will be considered as filthy rags. 
their judgment will be only bad. And it will lead to total condemnation and the wrath of God for eternity, which is experienced in hell. The saved, listen, don't get punished for any sins done in this life because their sins have been washed away by the blood of Jesus Christ. So our judgment will be only good. And it's all about determining your reward. As a Christian, you don't have to fear judgment day. You should only look forward to it. But the truth of the matter is, and this is where the message is about to take a turn to the challenging district. Some people are gonna have more to look forward to on judgment day than others because some Christians are going to receive a far greater reward than others. The word reward in Greek is misthos. And amen, yeah. And it communicates the idea of wages, dues paid for work, a reward. It appears about 20 times in the New Testament. Your eternal reward is based on how you build in this life. And Paul uses a metaphor of building and fire. Some people build with wood, hay, and straw, very flammable material, right, that would quickly burn up, whereas other people build with gold, silver, and jewels, precious material, costly material that doesn't burn and would essentially last forever. Fire is often associated with purification and testing or judgment in Scripture, You could live a very busy life, but the purifying fire of judgment will reveal what you did that has eternal impact with your life. Will your life's work, think, will your life's work pass through the fire of judgment or be consumed by it? Jesus will judge and reward Christians based on their eternal impact. There will be Christians who get into heaven who lived very busy lives, but they lived lives that didn't make a very big eternal impact. Although their schedule was full, their eternal reward will be little. And I'm gonna explain this. What does the gold, silver, and jewels that you build with in this passage represent? Well, you gotta consider the context of the passage. In these first couple chapters, basically all Apostle Paul's been talking about is the message of the cross, the power of God for salvation. I planted the seed, Apollos watered, the Holy Spirit made it grow. John 4, 36, Jesus shines light on this. He says, the harvesters are paid good wages. There's that same word, misthos. And the fruit they harvest is people brought to eternal life. What joy awaits both the planter and the harvester alike. Amen. Amen? Talk, talking about the salvation of human souls here. Human souls are eternal. They last forever. So when you make an impact on an eternal soul that lasts forever, you have clearly, indisputably done something that will result in eternal reward. These souls who are saved forever We'll be in heaven together, and together we make up the church, big C, capital C church of Jesus Christ. We are God's building, built on the foundation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Who's counting how many times I've taken? I'm just kidding. So your heavenly reward is largely based on what you did to reach the lost and build the church. Now look, I'm not talking about getting into heaven or not, right? We're clear on that. I'm not talking about getting into heaven. Heaven is not your reward. Heaven is Christ's reward that he has gifted to you. So listen, it's possible to get into heaven through faith in Christ but have no reward waiting for you in heaven if you waste your life. Imagine that, imagine if you were a Christian who was just really good with money and you were so diligent to save and invest and 
out of every paycheck. You put money aside for years and years and years and you, and you lived on a budget and you denied yourself and you got to retirement age and your 401k was filled with millions upon millions of dollars. Imagine that one day you die and you get into heaven and you go through those pearly gates and you roll up to the ATM at the heavenly credit union and you find a zero balance in your heavenly account. And you think, huh, that's weird. Must be a clerical error. <laughs> you know, I'm gonna ask Jesus about this right after I go check out my mansion in the sky. And you stroll around the street, <laughs> and what do you see? A real cute, sweet, one room little cottage tucked back, and you think, again, weird. I was expecting it to be a little more mansion-y. I'm gonna ask Jesus about this. So you go and you find Jesus and you sit down with Jesus and you say, Lord, I'm, I'm confused. And he says, what is wrong, my, my friend? He said, you know, I, I saw that my heavenly bank account showed a zero balance. I'm sure that must be a mistake. And I found my mansion, but it wasn't a mansion. It was a little cottage and I'm kind of disappointed. And he said, well, let me assure you, in heaven we don't make mistakes. <laughs> and honestly, he say, I'm a little hurt that you're disappointed with your house because I did the best I could with all that you sent ahead. In fact, it took a fishes and loaves kind of miracle <laughs> to even produce that. On the other hand, there will be people who in this life did not have a lot of money at all, didn't drive nice cars, never took a fancy vacation, lived on a tight budget, but faithfully served the Lord every week at church and faithfully tithed the first 10% of every paycheck to their church, whether it was much or little, and faithfully shared Jesus with lost people every time the Lord provided an opportunity. And those people will get to heaven and will look like Scrooge McDuck swimming in their lake of gold. Mansions so big, it'll have its own zip code. <laughs> and people might wonder, well, shouldn't we just do good because we love Jesus? And the answer is no. You should do good because you love Jesus and because you love Jesus people, and because you want an eternal reward. See, the health, wealth, and prosperity teachers, they often will twist scripture in a way that promises a reward in this life. When the Bible really promises that even if you're faithful, you might get nothing but pain and persecution in this life, but your reward in heaven will be great. And Jesus tells us about our reward. Apostle Paul writes about our reward. God wants you to know that there will be a reward because he wants you to know that there will be a reward so that you will work towards that with the end in mind, with the finish line in mind, with the reward in mind. Let me illustrate this further. Matthew 6, verse 19, Jesus says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Look what it says, look at what it says. Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Jesus said that. When you reach the lost, when you build the church, you are storing up for yourself a good reward in heaven. When you tithe to your local church, to the Lord through your local church, when you give offerings, you're not spending money, you're saving money. You are investing money into your heavenly account where the market only goes up and every investment results in a good reward. Paul is talking about systematically building in a way that results in the salvation of other people in 1 Corinthians 3. 
And there are different ways you can do that. You know, you can serve the Lord. You can do good deeds with your life that will build the kingdom of God and result in a reward. You can share Jesus with people and lead them to Christ. You can plant that seed. You can water it and receive a reward. But one way that we can all build for eternal impact to receive a reward is through faithfully giving our tithes and offerings. This is one of the most practical and tangible ways you can live this out on a weekly, monthly basis, your entire life to systematically plan to build the kingdom of God in a way that will result in eternal reward. Just like people gave in Jesus's day to fund his ministry, people give today to fund the continuation of his ministry through us. The poor get fed, The gospel gets preached, marriages get saved, lives get changed, believers are equipped, and the next generation of believers are raised. The local church is the mechanism that Jesus uses to build the kingdom and bring heaven to earth. So if you want to build the kingdom, if you want to receive a reward, one of the easiest ways you can do it is to build his church. And local churches run on the giving of their own people. Building is systematic and tithing is systematic. You don't accidentally tithe once in a while by accident. You decide you will do it and you make it a part of your life. You make it a part of your budget. And every time you receive an increase or an inheritance or an investment pays off or a paycheck, you already know the first 10% is the Lord's. And as the spirit leads me, I will joyfully give offerings in addition to this as I'm able. And you know that this results in the church that grows and reaches more people who have eternal souls. This eternal impact results in eternal reward. When you tithe, you're not spending money. You're saving money. When you give offerings, that money's not gone. It's stored up for you in heaven. Malachi 3.10 says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, God speaking, that there may be food in my house. This is God speaking to his people, still speaking to us today. He says, bring the whole tithe. A tithe is 10%. And it's not my 10% to do with as I please. So I can't send a little bit to my favorite televangelist and a little bit to my K-Love pledge and a little bit to my cousin who's going on a missions trip to Africa. No, the whole tithe is the Lord's and he tells us what to do with it. He says, bring it into my house. His house in Old Testament times, he had one. It was the temple where his presence dwelled. And today... There are many local churches where people gather to worship his name. And so we bring our whole tithe to his house that there would be food in his house. And this is spiritual food that nourishes the souls of the people who gather in the house to worship the Lord. So the preaching of God's word, which nourishes your soul, the encouragement you feel as we worship the Lord together in his presence, the training and equipping you receive to raise your children, the instruction that your children receive, the ministries of this church for men and for women, the recovery ministries like Celebrate Recovery, divorce care, marriage counseling, all these things are the spiritual food funded by the whole tithe that is brought into the house of the Lord. And you are the one building God's house when you give to it and serve in it. I can't help but wonder, what if God is gonna take care of your heavenly house the way that you take care of his house on this earth? Oh, I think, I think that's exactly how it's gonna work. Here's what's incredible about giving to build Christ's church. When we tithe and give offerings, that money literally builds up the local church, like literally, like the chairs that we're sitting in, the lights that are shining so we're not sitting in the dark, the blessed, blessed air conditioning that blows in the summer. (laughs) All these things are funded by tithe dollars. Let me be clear, tithers fund it, not tippers. Some people tip. Tipping is not bad. 
but you just got to be clear on the difference between tipping and tithing. Imagine tipping Jesus, right? Like, tipping... <laughs> tipping is what you do to show appreciation to the people who serve you well. So you, serve, you, you tip your waiter, you tip the bellman, right? Good job, thanks for the good service. But tithing is what you do to show honor to the people who saved you. Uh, and that would be Jesus. <laughs> tithing is what you do to show honor to Jesus who saved you from hell. To show, to show you are first place in my life, and, and that includes every part of my life, my budget, my finances, which let's be honest, is really personal and really sensitive. This is why Jesus said where your treasure is, your heart will be also. There's like a tether between your wallet and your heart. Whatever you invest your money into, your heart will be there also. You'll care about it. It's why you care about your kids so much, because they're so dang expensive. <laughs> you spend a lot of money keeping those kids alive. So be clear, Jesus does not deserve just a tip. Like, hey, good job with church today, Jesus. That word was nice. Here's a little fiver for you. That, that message was good, Jesus. Well done. Here's a 20. No, tithing is how you show honor to the Lord. And be encouraged that this act of giving faithfully, systematically, on purpose, with persistence, will result in an eternal reward. And every time you see a hand raised to accept the Lord. Every time you see someone submerged in the waters of baptism, you can celebrate the new life that they're experiencing in Jesus, and you can celebrate that your reward in heaven is increasing every time, every time. And you, you can take a sense of satisfaction, a righteous satisfaction. I'm a part of that. I contributed to that. It was the Lord who made it grow. He gets the credit, but I will share in the reward. Over the span of years, thousands and thousands of people have already been saved in this church, and many, many more will come in the years ahead. The church of Jesus Christ is being built on the foundation of Jesus Christ, and the message of his death and resurrection you should want a good heavenly reward because you should want to be a good and faithful servant. There's a common misconception that the Lord highlighted to me this week that everyone in heaven who enters in will hear, well done, good and faithful servant. And that's not true. In 1 Corinthians 3.15, we read this verse, it said, but if the work is burned up, the builder will suffer great loss the builder will be saved, saved from hell, gets into heaven, yes, because we're saved by faith, but like someone barely escaping through a wall of flames. This is the guy that gets into heaven, eyebrows singed off, <laughs> clothes smelling like smoke. Woo! I'm glad to be here, but with nothing to show for their life. How sad would it be to spend your whole life on earth as a consumer Christian, saved from hell, but barely? Get into heaven with no reward to show for a life that didn't produce anything of lasting value. The phrase, well done, good and faithful servant, comes from Matthew 25 and the parable of the talents. The, in the parable of the talents, the master entrusted servants with some of his wealth and he commanded them to use it wisely to produce a return on investment that he expected to receive back when he returned. And when he came back, he found that one servant was faithful with what he had received, invested it, and produced a return. You gave me two talents, and here are two more back in addition. You gave me five talents, and here are five more back in addition. But there was one servant who took what he received and buried it and just returned that one talent back to the Lord. Here, Lord, here's the one talent you gave me back, the one bag of silver, the one bag of gold. You, know, you gave it to me, and I was afraid of losing it, so I didn't do anything with it. I buried it in the sand, in the mass master said to that servant, you wicked and lazy servant. Take what he has and give it to the one with 10. But those who were faithful with what they received, 
they heard, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into your master's joy. Come on, let's celebrate. That's what they heard. Do you want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant? Then you've got a plan ahead now to be a good and faithful servant. And I pray that we would, by God's grace, if you follow Jesus faithfully throughout your life, you will make what feels like many small and great sacrifices for the Lord's glory. But let me encourage you, friends, whatever you do and whatever you give for Jesus will result in a reward far greater than you could possibly imagine. And I pray that the Lord would help us to be good and faithful servants. Amen. Amen. Would you bow your heads with me? Lord, thank you for helping me preach this whole service. <laughs> thank you for my friends who are gathered at church today and the encouragement of your word. We thank you for this opportunity to be a part of the church that you are building. I pray for anyone who is here right now who's far from God, and you know that all that awaits you if you were to die right now in this state of separation is an eternity in hell, and right now the Lord is calling you to receive Jesus for eternal salvation. This is your moment of salvation, to put your faith in Christ Jesus and receive the gift of eternal life that he offers you. If that's you, I want you to pray this prayer with me right now, wherever you're at. Right now, just repeat it wherever you're sitting and say, God, I confess my sin to you. I need your forgiveness. I receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I believe that Jesus died on the cross and suffered for my sins. I believe that Jesus rose again, granting me eternal life through faith. I thank you for this gift of salvation. I know I could never earn it, but I receive it with gratitude. Lord, thank you for always loving me and I ask you now to lead me from this day forward as a good and faithful servant for your glory that I would live out the rest of my days with eternity in mind in Jesus' name. Listen, right now, wherever you're at, if you just pray that prayer, let's keep our heads bowed for just one second, church. If you just pray that prayer with me, just raise your hand wherever you're at. I just wanna recognize that. Anyone else? That's good. Great, thank you. Be bold about it. You just prayed that prayer to receive Jesus, to receive salvation. Just raise your hand up. South Mountain, Fountain Hills online. Awesome, that's great, man. Thank you, man, that's good. Anyone else, just raise your hand up. That's good, awesome, you guys, so good, good. Let's just take a moment for this. Praise God for the gift of salvation. If you just accepted Jesus right now, awesome, in the top, I see you there, that's great. You just accepted Jesus is the best decision you're ever gonna make. It's gonna change your entire eternity. And there's something powerful about responding to that physically that helps solidify the decision you just made in your heart. Just raise your hand up if that was you. I just wanna recognize that. We're not gonna embarrass you or do anything weird to you. Awesome, right here we got one. There, that's good, good. Okay, church, would you stand with me? We're gonna pray and then we're gonna respond to this message with the time of just worshiping the Lord. God, I pray for your people. I pray for us to be faithful and good servants with this time we have on earth, that you would be glorified through our work. We thank you, you get the credit, you get the glory, and you deserve it all forever and ever. Amen, amen. Let's sing.